Well, I'm glad to see so many of you here. And I'm very happy that finally we can get this program started. A few days ago, I came from the Esekibo Coast and we launched a similar program there. If you've been following the news, this program is to hire across our country a large number of our people who are looking to work or to study to give them some sort of part-time job so that whilst they're pursuing a career or they're pursuing their studies, they can um, then have the means to survive and to take care of their families. But before I talk about that, because I don't get the opportunity often to talk to people face to face, often you see us on television and it's so distant that you can't look people in their faces and say exactly what you wish. And so today, I'm getting that opportunity to do so. Now, we live in a very exciting time now. There are great prospects for our country. We have come a very long way through very hard work. And the last time I was here, two months ago, I outlined to people how turny and how difficult that path has been, particularly for the young people of this country who may not be so familiar with the path, say, the last 30 years of our history. And many of you are aware, and I hope, being on this program and upgrading yourselves in the future through the scholarship initiatives that we've started, that you will also spend some time on learning our economic history and our political history. Because only if we understand that history are we going to do the right things for our country. And our, our, we are only then would we be able to realize the full potential of this land. We have to be bold enough to see our mistakes of the past and co confront them and correct them. And so when I came here the last time, I spoke about a long period of undemocratic rule that we had in this country, almost 30 years of undemocratic rule. And what that led to, the consequences of a loss of democracy. So from the time of independence nearly to the early 90s, that is what happened. And in the 60s, we were considered the Singapore of the Caribbean, meaning one of the most advanced economies in the region. After three decades of undemocratic rule, we were when the Caribbean Conference of Churches came to Guyana to do an assessment, they found we were as poor as Haiti, the, low the, the lowest per capita GDP in the entire Western Hemisphere. Half of our people had fled. There were the industries, we were practically starving. Many of you, are particularly young people, do not know that we went through a period in this country when to eat bread made from wheat was a criminal act. You could go to jail. People used, the police used to come and check our pots. If you ate a can of sardine, you had to bury it, the can, because the police would lock you up for that. That's the history. And what came about, this is all because of a loss of democracy and bad economic policies. I pointed out the last time we came here too, that, and this is without any political partisanship, just a pure economic analysis, that when our debt in the early 90s took up 
about, it was over nine times the size of our economy. And we were using 153% of revenue to pay debts. That means we had to borrow to pay external debts in the early 90s. And if you don't believe me, just read Carl Greenwich, who was the Minister of Finance at that time. He, he, in the green mining construction arbitration, because the government had nationalized the green mining company here in the bauxite industry. And Carl Greenwich did an affidavit, and you can find those numbers in his affidavit. So you don't have to take my word for it, but that was the stark reality of the country. Imagine a country, you're starting off to rebuild a country where every cent in taxes you collect is not enough to even pay the debts that you have. Where are you gonna find money to pay higher wages and salaries, buy drugs for the hospital, fix the infrastructure? And that was the starting point. And today, even without the oil and gas sector, we became one of the most vibrant economies in the world. We had a, throughout the, the, the global financial crisis, we grew on average at about 5%. Our debt now is 16% of, down from 900% of the economy. Our economy has grown and our debt has been reduced. And we're using 6% of revenue now to service debt down from 153%. So just imagine you were running a home and you had to pay every cent of your salary and borrow to pay debts. Today, now, we only have to pay you 6% of your salary to pay debts. And that's where our country is today. And it required a lot of hard work to get there and a long haul. And that is why so many things that we would have liked to fix could not be fixed. But here in Linden and Region 10, the politics has been very negative and sometimes debilitating for the country. And often it's not based on facts, it's based on rumors. And so I urge you as young people particularly that you have a duty to yourselves and to your country and to your family to, for your, to, to ferret out the facts. When somebody says to you something, like I speak to you here today, don't believe me at face value. Go and check whether what I'm saying is the truth. And whether it comes from either side of the political divide, for yourselves, check that what people say is factual. And so the battle has been intense, and often the accusations of neglect and racism and all of those things are, are rife even now. And so if we take a fact-based walk through that history in this region, you will see the efforts that we have made to get Region 10 going. First of all, when we got into office in the early 90s, that was before many of you were born, we, we had a situation where the bauxite industry was on the verge of closure. They had a company called Minproc that the government at that time had hired, the PNC government, to close the industry. We couldn't let that happen. And that is why we managed throughout the period to get an investor to come to this region. But we lost quite a few jobs because the bauxite industry used to hire maybe 1,500 people. It went down to 500. And we then decided, the new government, even with the burden of having to pay back the debts, we decided that we had to find a way to create employment in this region. And so when I was Minister of Finance, I led a team here that did an area study. And out of that, as I explained the last time I came here, West Watuka, the road in West Watuka was opened up to open up agricultural lands. When I was Minister of Finance, we put in place the LEAF 
that is the incubator just by the market. We put in place a small loan, a grant system and loan, that is the LEND program. We built the new hospital. We built the Amelia's Ward housing scheme, block 22. Um, the, a whole range, a new water treatment plant, the infrastructure in this region. So when we get accused of neglecting the region, I say to the other side, you show me what you have done, something that I can touch. You can't love people in abstract. You can't say, I love you and I support you. The other side is discriminating against you. You show the evidence of your love. You have to show that. And that is why I've always said, let's have a fact-based debate between us and the other side on these issues. You tell me what you have done. And so I'm not going to go back into that history. I want to tell you about the more recent history of, of what took place. So I came here, I came here two months ago. And I said to people in the region that we have a plan to move for the region forward. Because in five years on the APNU with all the love, there very little was done nationally for housing and in this region. I can point to the two schemes that were built by the PPP, Block 22 and, and Amelia's Ward. So I said, you show me how much land you give to people, because this is a debate that we have. I can tell you how, who got the land. And this is why if you're following the debate at the national level, when I, when I went back from here, APNU hosted a press conference and said they wanted to talk about the land policy in the region. That was just two months ago from the time. Well, I can talk about it here today. I didn't respond to them because I thought they were very negative. Well, let me tell you a bit about who got the land. We have now decided, so when President Ali came here, that we're going to put $400 million into Millie's hideout to develop a new housing scheme there. That would, and the government would facilitate the building of 1,000 homes in that area. And we've started clearing the area already, less than two months into the, two years into the government. That is 400 million, the land is being cleared, and we build 1,000 homes there. We have all, since we got into office, another 400 house lots have been allocated at Amelia's Ward. Now we were putting in the infrastructure to go in to, to service those 400 house lots. And we heard people protesting. There were 16 persons who built um, buildings on the roadway where we were going to build the infrastructure. So Sherwin Graves, where is Sherwin? Sherwin is here, Sherwin came and met with them. And we allocated lots to the 16 people too. So we resolved the problem. But in spite said of being helpful, APNU was just critical. So 400 persons now who have received how got, that's in addition to the 1,000 homes we will build, 400 now will get the infrastructure to put up their properties and to build their homes. We have also built separately some 40 house lots of houses. 18 have been allocated and 22 more are being allocated. So that is only on the housing side. That's our plan, specific plan. So I say, what did you do in five years? Who got the land? Lowenfield, the chief elections officer, got in June of 2020, 200 acres at Millie's hideout. Now that's equivalent to 1,000 lots. If you take the 200 acres, you can get 1,000 lots, but they give it to one person. The same figure who at the press conference was criticizing me on land policy, he and his brother got land allocated to them days before, 
long after the election, days before the government change. This was way after March election. It was, if you look at the Gazette that was published, Winston Jordan gave a number of people land here, but only big people. Only the large ones and the politically connected ones. Ordinary people did not get. So when you come to talk to me, I raised that at a press conference about land policy and housing policy in this region. It's just talk. And that is what I hope people would analyze, question them on. Where were your plans? What did you do in five years of housing? Why didn't you do it? How is it that only a few people got their land and only big guys and politically connected people? And then contrast that with what we are doing now. So that is, that is important. If we want to go forward, those are the kinds of debates that we need to have. Secondly, they came here and said, when I went back, that I said to people here that we were going to increase the price of electricity and that they were going to fight it off. That was far from the truth. That was a blatant lie that Mr. Norton told. And he came here and went in front of the co-op and said, we are going to oppose it. So people who would not have heard me would think that that was what I said here. Far from it, I spoke about expansion and upgrading the electricity system here and across the, the country. I spoke about the tender that will go out before the end of the year to put in 35 megawatts of solar power in Burbies, Linden, and Essequibo. That is what I was talking about. Not, not taking away or increasing the power, but they know that's an emotional issue. So if you say that to people and they didn't hear, then if, if immediately they would be upset so he came and said that. I didn't respond to them much at that time, but now that I'm back here in Linden, I'm taking this opportunity to do so and to address all the lies that they told after we went, we went back. Then they talk about roads. We were not doing enough on roads. So I pointed out that since we got into office, we are now planning we have before the Islamic Development Bank a project for 120 million US dollars that we are hoping will be approved in June of this year, next month, that will repave the road from Suzdike to Linden because that highway is in a bad shape. We need to rebuild the entire highway. I pointed out that the contract for 190 million US dollars a few weeks ago, as Hill and the others were here, Minister of Finance, to sign that contract, it's $190 million from Linden to Mabura. And I pointed out that we are now designing a new bridge to cross the river here now. And that will be tendered way before the end of the year. That alone is over $300 million US dollars that we'd be spending on from Suzdike to Mabura, including the bridge. I asked them, where were your plans for the roads? Because we managed to get all of these loans approved and grants approved since we've gotten into office. Then I pointed out that we've set aside $550 million to do community roads across the region in Kwakwani and here in Linden. <coughs> That is the biggest allocation to the region ever in our history for roads. But when I came here, people were very concerned about their roads. So when we went back, we increased it now from 550 to a billion dollars now to be spent on community roads, all the small roads in many of these areas. So they were talking about roads in the re region. You've had five years, you didn't do anything much, but now you're very critical when we have laid out our program. And they're very much aware of this 
because they're in the parliament too when we present our plans there. But come to lie to people out here and snipe all of the time. So, also, when I came here the last time, I mentioned to people that we were going to we are going to create the jobs. But before I do that, for the people in the riverine areas, the Demerara and, and Barbies rivers, I promise that we will do an assessment village by village. Many of them have issues with the, the schools and the quality of health care and everything else there. So I sent a team of ministers, and the team of ministers visited 12 villages in the Barbies and the Murara rivers. Now I have the report to work on those communities so that the riverine communities are not neglected. This is important. We have a plan now to upgrade the Linden Hospital to, in a major way so that the most of the services you can get in the city, you'll be, get, be getting right here in the region. And we spoke a bit about that too. So what are on the job side, I pointed out that what we are doing, let me go to the gold scholarship first, or maybe the jobs, let me deal with this. I, I, so when we go across Guyana now, we've had to try to get our economic policy going swiftly um, since we got into office. In the period pre-election, pre-COVID, Guyana lost about 35,000 jobs. And why did this happen? This was before COVID. This happened because of government policies. And let me explain why so you can understand what I'm saying and then you can check it for yourselves. The sugar industry, 7,000 people were laid off. Then the government put the va a value added tax on machinery and equipment. So immediately, if you're buying machinery and equipment to invest in agriculture, in mining, in forestry, you had to pay 14% VAT on it. If you're buying, for example, a piece of equipment that costs $25 million, that runs the taxes alone run into millions of dollars. You can't want jobs and tax the means through which people create jobs. So immediately, they, we saw a dip in investments in these sectors. In the mining sector, they changed the incentive regime. Even the, the final tax was changed. They put it from a 2% final tax to 28%. We had to fight to get it down back. And now, since we got into office, we have reversed that. So mining dipped. The forestry sector, in 2019, we were producing half of what we were producing in 2014. In Region 10, you know what happened. Many of the people who were in, employed in the forestry area, the market practically collapsed. And so 35,000 jobs were lost. And then when the COVID hit, another 35, 40,000 jobs were lost because the country was shut down. So we came into government with a deficit, leaving out people who were looking for jobs but about 80,000, 75, 80,000 people who had lost jobs. So we said in our manifesto, we want to create about 50,000 new jobs. But clearly now, the task is even bigger. We have to do much, much more if we want to get our people employed. And so that was a big problem. And then we recognized if we kept the country shut down, like so many other countries were doing, like Trinidad and Tobago, nothing worked. Then that would even cause greater hardships. So the first cabinet meeting that we've had in the new government, we said, 
we are reopening our airport. And you had a big disagreement in the cabinet. They said this may not be the right strategy, but we decided to open up the economy. And today, we were vindicated because what happened is that the countries that had shut down, they, their death rate is even higher than ours, but they had a major economic fallout. <clears throat> in our case, we've been able to keep the economy going, regenerate some of the jobs because of that balanced look. And at the same time, and at the same time, try to build a capability to address the pandemic and keep our people safe. So 40 tests we were doing per day when we got in. Now we have a capability of doing 5,000 a day. And we have an ICU, hospital, and a whole range of other things. We, I know many people didn't want to take the vaccine for all sorts of reasons. And we, that is why today we remove all the restrictions back again. But, but we saw the developed world hung on to the vaccine. It was like an apartheid system that poor countries in Africa or the Caribbean or so, even we had the money to buy it, they would not give us the supplies. We had to hunt around the world. And luckily, we managed to get about 80% of our adult population vaccinated. So that helped in a way. And today, our numbers are lower. If you look on a per capita basis, our death rate is lower, maybe less than half of the United States of America. All they had all the best medical care in the world. And we still kept our economy open. That was the dual strategy that we approached. And because of that, we managed to get people to go back to work, like all the waitresses and people in the tourism sector and the taxi drivers who had lost their job. They started working back. But that's not enough. Now we're coming out of the pandemic with this big task ahead. We can't aim for 50,000 jobs that we campaign on. We said if we win, we will do 50,000. We have to do much, much more to generate jobs. But it's becoming harder because in all parts of the country. Because what has happened is region four and three, a lot of investment flow in those areas. So we are having job shortages in some of the, these areas. But in Barbies, in Esikubo, in Linden, Region 10, in Region 5, in the hinterland areas, we're not getting as many investments because people, the investors, don't want to come out so far. So we now have to find other activities to find jobs for people until we can train them or we can get investments coming into their community or they can travel to work in Region 4. And so we decided we're going to launch this initiative. So it's going to be about eight, eight to 10,000 of our people hired through this initiative. They will get $40,000 a month for 10 days work. So they will stagger. And the 10 days, it's not free money. You have to work. So, but you don't have to go in the fields, etc., because we need a lot of people to assist in the hospitals. We need some to assist in the libraries, in the schools. We can place people in different agencies so they're doing productive work, whilst we're hoping also that they would study. And this brings me to another point that I've been talking about. So you know in our manifesto, before the elections, we say if we win the elections, we'll make the University of Ghana education free in the five years, within the five years, and we plan to do that. But we also, we also said we want to do 20,000 scholarships, online scholarships. So as soon as we got into office, we brought back Professor Obadir, he was at the University of the West Indies, and he is now in charge of that project for us. And we have given out 6,000 scholarships so far. This year will be another 5,000. The last time I was here, I met with a lot of young people in this region who were part of that program, the scholarship program. But I've also been saying we're not satisfied in doing 20,000 for the country in the five years that we promised. If we can find 
500 people, 5,000 people in this region who want to eventually study, the government will pay for their scholarships. So as many people as we can find, because we want our people to upgrade their skills. Now, many of them may not be able to go to a tertiary level program that is a university program or a technical program. So that is why we recently launched a remedial course. So if you didn't finish CXC or you didn't have enough of the um, like qualified, you didn't, weren't qualified to move on to one of the tertiary level programs, then in three to six months, you can be prepared and you'll gain acceptance into one of those online programs. So I hope that all of you who are now gonna work on this program, you see this as a stepping stone to something bigger. Not this is the end in itself. This is not the end in itself. That is where I want to be for the rest of my life, doing a part-time job. That you use this as a stepping stone, that you make sure that you continue to study or seek another employment that pays you more. That is what we are hoping. This is just to ensure that people have some income at this point in, in time. This is, a, this is how I want you to see the program. And I want all the people in Region 10, Linden, a lot of young people here, I want you to also make full use of the online scholarship programs that we have launched. Now, that is what I would like to talk about. M Mr. Norton and the others talk about education, but what specifically, how did you offer the people in Region 10 an opportunity to do tertiary education? How did you do so? Now, no plan then and now, but, but you, you talk about discrimination. Now, every, every time, so let me go back to some of the other things that we promised. Because I, when I was in Essequibo Coast, I said to people that there were lots of promises we made before the elections. We promised to restore the children's grant. Now, there was a $10,000 grant that every school child had. It cost us the government $1.67 billion because we had 167,000 kids in school. APNU claimed they couldn't afford to keep that, so they took it away. But my argument that the food bill in government increased by over $1.6 billion in the five years. Couldn't find the money to give the school grant, but the government food bill alone that the government was eating increased by over 1.6 billion. So it was just a matter of priority. Priority. And you can check this. All, don't, don't believe me. Go to the estimates. Check dietary in the budget in 2014 and check what dietary was, the sum of money allocated in 2020, and you can then see the growth. You check it for yourself. So you don't have to believe me. But that was where the priority was. So we said we will reintroduce it and we'll ensure that every school child within the five years, by the end of the five years, they get $50,000 per year, every school child. This year it has gone from zero to already $25,000 per child. And that would be distributed shortly. And then we have more than increased the, the school uniform Grant was $2,000, it's now $5,000 since we got into office. So we intend to make sure that our kids, they get the help. We promise also to double old age pension in the five years. We have increased it in the first two years by 40%. So that promise is there. We promise to restore the joint services bonus APNU took away the one-month tax-free bonus that the joint services, our police, soldiers, firemen, and the others were getting, claiming it was a political bribe. I don't know if you gave the soldiers more money. In, in any case, they got the majority of the votes there and still claim it was a political bribe. Well, we restored it so that 
they, those who are working in our joint services, they can enjoy it. We reverse all the taxes on, on water and electricity on food items, a whole range of stuff since we got into office because these were pre-election promises we made. We believe in keeping our promises. And when we said we want to work to change our whole country, we believe it. Not now, but in the past. But a lot of times, you have to understand, that is why I said the history of the country, particularly the economic history of the country, so that you will know what the limitations were to implementing many of our programs, because it was a financial limitation. Now that the oil and gas industry is coming, so you hear lots of things. You hear that the PPP is giving Norton and the others, the PPP is giving its supporters oil and gas money everywhere else, which in 10 is neglected. Well, up to three weeks ago, we had not transferred a single cent from the oil and gas natural resources fund to the treasury. It meant we had not used a cent of the oil and gas money since we got into office. Up to three weeks ago, only three weeks ago, the first transfer was made to the treasury to be spent now on financing some initiatives. And that's $200 million, 200 million. That's less, that's nearly around the same price at the road from Linden to Mabura. That's 190 million US. 200 million was transferred. That's all so far been transferred. Nothing else has been utilized. But if you listen to them, you would believe that, oh, PPP is giving people in Burbies because they support the PPP or executable all of this money. It's nonsense. Secondly, they claim that you can, when they are in office, they, now they take ownership of the industry. But you, I recall Mr. Bulkan in front of the Marriott saying, they were saying that the Marriott was a corrupt building built by the PVP and they were converted into a hospital in 2050. Well, I didn't see no conversion into a hospital. In fact, I always saw a lot of ministers enjoying themselves at the Marriott. It's one of the most profitable Marriott in the world. It's owned put fully by the government. But outside of that building in 2015, he was protesting. And he said, PPP was saying that they found oil and gas just before the elections. It was an election gimmick. It wasn't an election gimmick. We actually had found oil and gas, as the country now knows. They signed a lopsided agreement in 2016 that now we have to live with. So where was this move now to help people? Suddenly they said, because it sounds popular, we should give every Guyanese four to 5,000 US dollars per year. It sounds good, free money. But what does that mean? If you look at the size of our population, which is close to a, billion, a million people, maybe 800,000 to a million, depending on what the counts. That's over $4 billion, somewhere in the range to three to $4 billion, maybe five, up to $5 billion if it's a million. $5 billion US dollars, guess how much we're collecting from the oil and gas sector up to now? We have collected in the last two years. 350 million US dollars per year, but they want us to distribute 10 times more than what we collect. Now, it sounds good because people think it's free money. Oh, we, we get this free money. It's impossible. It's politicians talking nonsense to fool people again. You have to do your own maths. I know anybody who says that you, you don't have to need work, that we're so rich you don't have to work hard anymore, point them to the U.S. Their per capita GDP is $72,000, U.S. dollars. Ours is nine, and they work three jobs over there. They work three jobs. So don't listen to people who tell you there's free money. We have to utilize 
oil and gas money. We have to save some for the future. We have to spend, use some on education, on health care. That is why I don't want to lay out the health care plan for the country, but it's a massive one. I just mentioned about upgrading the hospital here, but we have a massive program about putting in world-class infrastructure that will change our country and stimulate the non-oil sector so in the long run we can have jobs in those areas. The only way we can really have a bright future is if we plan for it and not through short-term policies but long-term policies. And that is what we have done in the PPP progressively. Every time we've been in office, you see the clear direction. We know where we want to go, and the policies are all headed in that direction. So I relish, I know they're going to snipe again when I go back. The regional chairman, when I left the last time, said, oh, we don't want part-time jobs in Linden. We want full-time jobs. Well, you had five years to put the full-time jobs in place. In fact, the experience was the call center that I had built since I was president and I was employing 88 persons here. Three weeks after the APNU, APNU got into office, it was shut down. 88 persons lost their jobs. Now we have a new call center. They had 150 persons I gather and they'll probably hire another 150 soon. That is what you did for jobs. You tell me how many full-time jobs you provide it, but he doesn't want part-time jobs, a thousand part-time jobs. He wants full-time jobs. Jack Dale should keep those jobs. Well, he, he has a job already. He's doing extremely well. You tell that to other people who don't have an income that they don't want a part-time job. But this is what we have to contend with, and I know they're going to be lying again about what we say here, because today... They came and they set a meeting just next door to ours this afternoon. I have another meeting. But this is life. We have a free country. And all I ask is that we debate on a factual basis. Because for them, everything is about race. This country, if it gets swallowed up in that argument, it would destroy us. Where everything is seen only through the spectrum of how we look or which party we belong to. This is important, working for the country, because we need all of our people now. In fact, we may have in the future to, uh, to import laborers to come here and work here. Many of them already want to come because they see that future that is coming. So here in 10, I want you to make sure that you prepare. Use this as a stepping stone. There are lots of other initiatives on job creation, co-investing in, in facilities up here that we will work on. And progressively, I'd welcome a chance to keep you abreast from time to time about this, this that's going on, that these initiatives, and to get you involved. And I ask you to do one thing, as I said before. Please focus on the facts. Read for yourselves. Don't listen. To, like one man on TikTok saying, oh, we should stop working now, we are a rich country and stuff like that. And believe that. You know, this TikTok culture and everything else and social media, you get a lot of info, but you have to process the information. And you get a lot of lies too, and a lot of racism coming through. And we must fight all of this aggressively if our country is to progress the way we want it to. So today, I just wanted this brief opportunity to talk to you. We'll be working at business development. As I said before, there are lots of other initiatives in the region, housing and, and job creating initiatives. You'd see us more often, the ministers. Minister Todd is here. He comes out here frequently, our foreign minister. Have you seen him? I'm stand up, Todd, because many of them may not know you. So when he comes, don't run him out of your area to welcome him, right? <laughs> Our foreign minister, you know Minister Dharam Lal too, and many others. Ed Hill works up here. And so I, we'll be here more often, and I want to assure the people who raised matters with me the last time I was here, we have a note of these issues. We took down your, your numbers. We've been calling people. 
So we'll keep working through the issues. Now, outside of the job when you're registered for today, so you can start working. If there is any personal issue that you wish us to follow up on, that you're confronted, a lot of people have NIS problems and all sorts of things. I have my staff here. They can make the notes. All we need is your name and a number, and then you can call and explain to us. We'll call you and you'll explain what the nature of the problem is because we've set up a unit at the office of the president to follow up on these issues. But it's good to see all of you here today and a lot of people, it's a thousand people that will start working two days from now. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh,